There's a question in here. I haven't got it on top, but we'll get to it. Oh, yes, I do have it. Uh, about titles of books. I've put a sheet of paper above the um, bowl where the questions go in and have listed the Majjhima Nikaya, the Middle Lens Discourses, the Digger Nikaya, the Long Discourses, published by Wisdom, and I have written on it the address of the BPS, the Buddhist Publication Society in Kandy, and have suggested that you get their catalog, and out of the catalog you order the discourses of the Buddha, which are translated by Nanaponika, Nanamuli, or Bhikkhu Bodhi. If you really want to know, it's all written there, all you have to do is copy it. <laughs> I don't expect you to remember it. My expectations aren't very great. <laughs> I suggest that if you really want to know what Buddhism is, that you get it, so to say, from the horse's mouth. You get it from the Buddha. The middle end things, the long discourses, and the discourses that the BPS has published are all the words of the Buddha. This um, little uh, question here says quite rightly that I can cut through the mountain of books now available and not be overwhelmed by the glut of information. It's, um, there are an enormous number of Buddhist books available now, and the reason for that is that the publishers have found that they sell. It's the only reason the publishers want to make money. Wisdom Publications is somewhat of an exception. It's a non-profit organization. So, although they also have to make money, obviously, in order to keep in business, but at least it's not their first concern. There is a glut on the market of Buddhist books. And that's why I'm saying, read the Buddha's words, but don't read them like all the rest of the books. They have to be studied, remembered, and practiced. And if you can't remember, and most people can't, make yourself some notes. It's the only way that you'll ever get to know what the Buddha really taught. Now there are some other books which do talk about what the Buddha really taught, but it goes too far to list them all. If you get those, the Majjhima and the Digha Nikaya, and then those from the BPS, I would say that you have enough to do for the next 20 years. And you don't need all the other stuff that's around. If you want to, of course you can read it, but some of it, some of it is a waste of time. And some of it is not actually according to what the Buddha taught. And some of it is very fine commentary and explanation. But to sort that out, one has to first know what he taught in order to know what is worth reading. So find out what he really taught, and then you can make up your own mind. Life is an adult education class. There's no doubt about it. But don't rely on the teacher. Adults can teach themselves. In a consumer society such as this, that's pretty unknown. Don't go along with that. We all have wisdom. Use it. The more you use it, the more of it you get. Don't rely on others. This is Independence Day. <laughs> Learn to be independent. You said after the sweeping meditation that if we felt nothing at the top of the head to work upwards from the eyes for a few times. I still feel nothing. Can you give some suggestions? Are there certain things I need to be aware of? 
Well, first of all, I was only using the eyes as an example. What I really said was, start at the point, the first point you felt something. And if that was the eyes, for instance, start at the eyes. If it was the back of the neck, start at the back of the neck, wherever. Wherever was the first point you felt something. And here we have, I think, a basic and uh, quite um, uh, profound misunderstanding what it means to feel something. The person who wrote this question, please, can you feel your upper lip on your lower lip? Can you feel your eyelid on the eye? Can you feel your seat on the cushion? Can you feel your hand on the knee? Can you feel your shirt on your back? Can you? I'm sure you can. I would be a rare person that can't. So rare that it would be actually um, a matter of intention. It's impossible not to feel something that touches. Gwenka used to tell a wonderful story about that, which just comes to mind. He was the uh, main teacher of this method, or he is, I should say, not was, but this is many years ago, goes back many years. Maybe he's still telling the story, I don't know. He said that he was in the uh, Uberkin Meditation Center, and uh, Uberkin was the original teacher of this method, and he had advised one of his friends who was suffering from migraine headaches to come and learn this uh, method. Well, the friend came and they gave him a little room and asked him to practice there. And Gwenka went to the little room and explained the method. Well, after two hours, Gwenka went back to that room to find out how his friend had done. And his friend was sitting there, totally naked. So he said to him, so how did it go? What's happened? <laughs> and the friend said, didn't feel a thing. And Gwenka says, and why are you naked? He said, I was sweating and perspiring. Water was running down everywhere. I had to take my clothes off. <laughs> And then Gwenga said, oh, you didn't feel anything. He said, not a thing. <laughs> well, this is not dissimilar, is it? <laughs> Sit and feel your sitting. Have your feet on the mat and feel or on the ground and feel it. So where, whatever you do in the sleeping, wherever you start, go by touch sensation this one here that doesn't feel anything go everywhere where there is a touch sensation do it once twice three times until you don't have to pay attention to that what touches but only to the sensation if there's no me <laughs> what is the owner of my karma very careful not to see who's the owner of my karma as long as we believe in me, we make karma and own it. Arahant makes no karma. Nobody there to make karma. As long as we believe it, feel it, know it. Obviously, it's me sitting on this pillow trying to figure out what's going on. So long we make karma. If one can do the jhanas, what daily practice do you recommend? Does it matter if it's mindfulness or metta or the meditative, meditative absorptions? Sorry, something about the ultimate goal. Um, it is the ultimate goal. I, that's one word I can't read, but that's the sense of it. It must be the ultimate goal to wake up. So is the intermediate aim 
of these practices different? Which do you recommend to facilitate progress on the path to the full extent of one's capacity? Well, the full extent of one's capacity could be Nibbana, which is equivalent to waking up. So if the word waking up is used here, it means Nibbana. The Buddha is often called the awakened one. That's all it means, being fully enlightened. So if that's one's capacity, then one needs to do everything one can. And if the person who's writing this can do the jhanas, what would deter him or her from doing them? What could possibly be the reason not to do them? They bring the utmost in purification. They bring the immediate and automatic insights. They are joyful and peaceful and they create an inner life which has an entirely different quality from the one we know. So why do anything else if one can do it? Obviously, metta should be the starting point of all meditations. Metta to oneself. One can use a little more time and practice a metta meditation to all the people one's going to see during that day or in the evening to all the ones one has seen, particularly the ones that one got irked by. But other than that, I can't see that there's any question what one should do. That's what needs to be done. And if you've read that bit that I hung about there, the page out of the Majjhima Nikaya, you must have seen that the Buddha said, this is the way to enlightenment. And he was talking about the fourth jhana then. And if you haven't read it yet, do read it. Would you kindly say a few more words about the type and quantity of thinking that remains in the first jhana? Are thoughts totally irrelevant to the ongoing experience of PD? permissible in the definition of first jhana? Well, I can't say a word about the type and quantity of thinking because I wouldn't have a clue what type of thinking and what quantity of thinking is going on in somebody's mind hopefully as little as possible. The, um, they're all irrelevant, all thoughts are irrelevant. It's an experience. And all thinking is irrelevant when we want to explain something. But in the first jhana particularly, there it's not uh, that they're either permissible or not permissible. They are an unfortunate byproduct because the mind has for so long been doing nothing else except think, it isn't quite ready to stop. If the um, experience is extremely profound, thinking does stop by its, on its own accord. Uh, but if it's very mild, it can still come as a disturbance. So the less we are disturbed, the better off we are. Are there any special practices for people who are seriously ill or dying to help them let go of identification with the body or get a favorable rebirth where the Dhamma would again be available? Well, the most preferable thing is to practice while you're still well. The Buddha mentioned that many times. Uh, if a person has practiced well during their lifetime, they know what to do at death particularly the jhanas. The Buddha practiced them on his deathbed and died between fourth and fifth jhana. If a person who is seriously ill or dying has not practiced anything at all, then it, um, it's usual practice and it's helpful to remind them of all the good things they've done in life. If we don't know them, we can ask the people who are near to them, tell them that they have lived a good life, a worthwhile life, make them comfortable in the mind. 
and then also mention that dying is only a transition. It's, uh, although the body disappears, the body at that time is a burden to them anyway. So they're getting rid of a burden. And uh, all these things are consoling. And in order to have a rebirth where the Dhamma would again be available, the traditional thing is to chant and preferably in the language that the person can understand and not in a foreign language. And to chant uh, the um, reverence and um, the um, qualities of Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha and any of the other chants which the one may know. It's a reciting, it's not singing, it's a reciting, but should be done in the language that the person understands. So that is considered to be uh, one of the causes for having a rebirth where Dhamma is available. Naturally, one's own karma has a lot to do with that too. But this is an exceptionally important aspect. If one can't chant, if one can't recite, if one hasn't remembered anything, one can read it. One can read out of any of the, the, uh, the scriptures the reverence and the, uh, um, the uh, qualities of Buddha Dhamma Sangha and that way turn the mind of the person in that direction. If there is no me, who is responsible, who, what, makes karma? Well, the me illusion makes karma. Everybody makes karma who is not enlightened. Constantly, with every thought. I hope that this is clear. That from now on, after this course, one's going to watch one's thoughts very carefully so as not to make bad karma. Every single thought makes karma. Some of it, of course, is neutral. But most of it is either wholesome or unwholesome. So me makes karma, obviously. When you refer to the Buddhist scriptures, are you talking about the Buddha's discourses? Are you referring to anything else? Not usually. I'm usually referring to the suttas the discourses. The uh, Pali Canon is also called the T Pitika. T is three, Pitika are baskets, the three baskets. The three baskets are Sutta, Vinaya and Abhidhamma. Sutta, the discourses of the Buddha, Vinaya, the rules of conduct for monks and nuns, and the Abhidhamma, the higher Dhamma or the uh, philosophical Dhamma, in categories mostly. The suttas are the most explicit of the whole explanation, but all of it has commentary and sub-commentary. So some of it might be out of commentary, some of sub-commentary. But most of what I refer to are the suttas themselves because they lend themselves most beautifully to study, to understanding and to practice. And that's why I'm recommending to you to get the Majjhima and the Digha Nikaya. And reading them, remembering them and practicing them isn't going to take 20 years. It's going to take the rest of your lifetime. And if you want to know what the Pali Canon consists of, there is also a real booklet at the BPS, at the Buddhist Publication Society, which explains that because it consists of many different things. And, but the most important are the suttas, the discourses, which one can see that they have been spoken by uh, one person and that they are actually 
a verbal. It's very easy to see. The Vinaya is too, but it is uh, very specialized. You have given me many things to think about, but meditation is not what you think. So what do I do now? Contemplate. That's why we're doing that. American Buddhism seems to largely be taught by lay teachers. And many of the lay teachers are psychologists trying to teach methods to be happy in the world. I am concerned about teachers picking and choosing which parts of the Buddha's teachings are palatable and leaving the rest out. Someone aptly coined the phrase Buddhism light. I'm... (laughs) That's a new one. I've heard other phrases. I'm working to help establish a Theravadan monastic presence in Northern California, and I coordinate an international computer network Dhammanet, a Dharmanet, to help people find Buddhist teachings. What else can be done to keep Buddhism in America from turning into Buddhism light? <laughs> or to turning back out of Buddhism light, why we one should say, huh? Okay. Um, my only uh, suggestion is, and the thought that came to mind when I read that was, one needs to find some people who are dedicated and committed to practicing the Dhamma, and they need to go off into a forest monastery to one of the great teachers, either in Thailand or even possibly in Sri Lanka or Burma, wherever, uh, preferably Tanachan Malboa in Thailand and stay there for five years and come back and teach. It's the only thing I can think of. When Westerners teach without having had the grounding in the teaching as it has been preserved for two and a half thousand years, they are lacking the discrimination between what is actually the Buddhist teaching and what is cultural and society um, additions. And so one gets to think that those cultural additions are also Buddhism. But Buddhism has been always been able and is now to adapt itself to any culture it comes to. And it's adapting beautifully to California, isn't it? (laughs) It can do it without even turning any uh, 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 hair. It just gets adapted. But that's not really what should happen. The adaptation into the cultural context where it finds itself needs to happen without watering down any of the teaching, but also without exporting or importing the cultural aspects when it comes from another country. We we are Westerners, so we have our own culture, and that own culture is part and parcel of the teaching, but there must be great care be taken that it's never watered down to the extent where the culture is overriding the teaching. And from this little uh, paper here, one would assume that that's actually happening. The culture is overriding the teaching. Be happy in the world. Have a nice day. That sort of thing. (laughs) 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 So that's not... Uh, useful. And that's not useful at all because it isn't going to last. You can have a nice day. What about the next one? So all I can think of, one has to get out, go into the forest and stay for five years. Now five years is not an arbitrary number that I've just thought up, but in our tradition you stay 
a minimum of five years with your teacher. And if the teacher then says, go and teach, okay, you go. And very often they do. But if they don't, you just keep on staying. So often also it becomes ten years. After ten years one would assume that a person who wants to teach would be able to. After five it should also be. Some people don't want to. They don't want to have the um, a difficulty of trying to tell people the things they don't want to hear. So, understandably so. And it's the only uh, uh, suggestion I have. I can't think of anything else. Maybe somebody else can think of something else, but that's all I can think of. And when one comes back from that kind of um, training, one knows <coughs> very well what belongs to that country where one was and what belongs to the Buddha's teaching. Also, the study that one can do in the books themselves, the ones I have told you, the Nikayas, the collections, is helpful. But a living teacher is something entirely different again. Because what you get is a personal example. And when you get a personal example and you see that it can be done actually, then buoyancy and happiness in the heart ensues. You can see it can be done. And it can be done on a level where you yourself feel, oh, I could do that too. After the 32 parts contemplation with all the parts in front of me, I, no, sorry, yeah, I or whoever, whatever was left, felt relief and not too excited about putting them all back together. <laughs> the feeling was of someone, the mind, question mark, hovering, looking at those bones and guts and things. This being was content to hover, but didn't know what else to do. After the parts were put back together, there was more tranquility than before. I'm not sure what I'm asking, except what next, or is what I'm doing okay? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that in our um, usual way of expressing ourselves, it's not useful to try and find a different word in the writing or speaking for I. It becomes either totally ununderstandable or so mixed up that one doesn't know anymore who one is talking about. Our language has evolved out of our understanding and feeling. And if we one day don't feel I anymore, that's great. But the Buddha also talked about I. Sometimes he talked about himself in the third person, the Tathagata. But very often he talked about I, and he was long enlightened. So don't hesitate to write your bits of paper with I in it. I know whom you mean. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first thing. Um, Doing this contemplation by yourself again, on your own, will be very helpful. Just to see what the reaction is. If you feel, if you feel again that you were, it, it provides tranquility, then it can very well be that it is a way of getting concentrated. <coughs> tranquility is always a result of concentration but it can also be a result of insight. So it can have provided either one or both. It can, this particular contemplation, can have provided concentration. And then the mind becomes tranquil. Because it's not <coughs> uninteresting to find all these bits and pieces. It can also have provided insight that it's impossible for any of those bits and pieces to say this is me. And that 
can be a feeling of relief. So the person who wrote this, please do it again and see what happens. And do it again also in your um, meditations when you leave here. It's a very helpful way and it is used also not just for insight but also it is used to minimize lust. But never take the person apart whom you are lusting after. <laughs> Always yourself. <laughs> My husband and I, partners for over 30 years, face the ultimate dukkha, except an accident happening to both at, at once. One of us must predecease the other. How can we prepare? Well, tomorrow we'll do contemplation on death. And I will try to mention everything that one could possibly uh, use in order to come to terms with this inevitable happening. The inevitable, which most people, practically everybody, would like to postpone to a more appropriate time. Uh, who knows which time is appropriate? So we'll do that contemplation tomorrow, and I won't talk about it now, so that we can actually um, have a longer period with it when we contemplate. I have a friend who is dying. When I sit down and just meditate, I'm aware of my sadness. If I meditate by starting with metta, may I be happy, may I be healthy, may I be peaceful, may I be free, and then do the body sweeping contemplation, I can concentrate on the light and experience and experience that I'm not sad. Light and, uh, no, sorry, that's not right. Um, uh, concentrate on the light and expansion, and I'm not sad. I don't want to misuse the contemplative reflection to deny or cover over my feeling. I am particularly concerned because I have trouble accepting my negative feelings of fear anger and sadness. Well, the thing to do is to first inquire into the fear, anger and sadness and see why. Why am I having those? Obviously because I'm not getting what I want. So, who's promised me that I would ever get, always get what I want? And it doesn't, uh, it's not um, wrong at times to do this this uh, metta, may I be happy, healthy, peaceful and free, and then do the sweeping in order to get out of the negative states of mind. Because the more negative uh, they are, and the longer we stay in them, the deeper they go. And in the end, it's very difficult to get out at all. So it's fine to get out of them at times, but then make an inquiry. What am I angry about? Why am I angry? Well, who am I angry at? The universe or what? And uh, what am I afraid of? Well, obviously one's own death, of course. What else? So inquire, find out, and then use the experience where you can get out of that negativity in order to keep the mind on an even keel. The Buddha said, in seeing there is there will be there will be only seeing in hearing only hearing in tasting only tasting etc so isn't the goal of meditation to get to the place of pure perception no the goal of meditation is sharpening the mind so that pure perception can take place outside of meditation. Outside the meditation hall, 
are the remains of a mouse, mostly skin and hair left, a graphic of today's contemplation from which I could get a sense of impermanence, suffering and corelessness. It smelled too. So obviously the doings of that pretty cat, huh? <laughs> There's no question with that. Then comes, since the world is a mental construct, would you tell the story of the creation? Was Dukkha intentional or evolutionary? Well, the world is not a mental construct. The meaning of the world the solidity of the world is a mental construct, not the world as such. And the Buddha talked about four imponderables. And the first one is the intricacy of karma. Doesn't have, it doesn't pay to try and figure out why is this happening because of that and so forth. The second imponderable is the power and the extent of influence that a person in jhana has. The third imponderable is the power and influence of a Buddha and the fourth is the beginning of the universe. He said none of those things would contribute towards reaching Nibbana. With, with, these, although, with these next 60 years being the most propitious possibility for attaining samadhi, no, not samadhi, nibbana consciousness, what is to happen to those with good karma if they don't attain either then or within the next 2,400 years? Why worry about it? <laughs> Do it now. There's no time like the present. Who can tell what's going to happen to a person in 2,400 years? Even the Buddha wouldn't be able to tell. I noticed that often my reactions are not conditioned by my feelings or likes and dislikes, but by the reactions or opinions of others. In some cases I approve of them, in other cases I contradict them, even if it's not in accord with my personal feelings. Could you please comment on this reaction mechanism and how to work on it? Well. The reactions and opinions of others, as we hear them or see them, we have a sense contact. And all sense contacts produce feelings. And as we have a feeling, we react to that feeling. So, we're always doing the same thing, only we are not quite sure what the trigger is. The trigger in this case are the opinions and reactions of other people as the trigger. So with that trigger comes either a, um, a pleasant or an unpleasant feeling. And when there is a pleasant feeling, then they get approval. That's a reaction. And if there's an unpleasant feeling, they get a contradiction, which is a reaction. So it's actually exactly the same thing as usual. So what we can do is when we hear the opinions of others, we can remember that the Buddha said there are no right opinions. They are all based on the me delusion. And then taking that as a sort of um, um, minus in that whole opinion uh, expression, that it's based on the me delusion, then we can deal with it easier. If we think that the opinion is the person then, of course, we can get very irate about it. But if we just realize that the opinion is based on a delusion and really has nothing to do with the essence of purity, 
which we all have within us, it's much easier that way. When did you become a nun? And what prompted you to take this step? I became a nun in 1979, and I thought it would help to practice. It did. <laughs> do the jhanas only arise in succession, and do they have to be practiced that way? Yes, they have to be practiced that way, but they do not ri arise in succession, particularly at the beginning when one isn't um, trained for them yet, and it's good to say taking pot luck. They can arise all over the place. And as they do that, one doesn't know exactly where one is and what one is doing. That's why it's of the utmost importance to do them one after the other. Having learned to do that, we then can go backward. Having gone all the way up to the eights, we can go back down from eight to one one after the other. That way we learn exactly what each feels like. And then, having learned that, then we can jump from one to six, from six to two, from two to eight, whatever we like. That is called <coughs> being a master of the jhanas. But first, step by step, each one. So when I reach the first jhana and the delightful sensations appear, I take them as my meditation object. With enough concentration, joy will then arise. That's not quite correct. Joy arises simultaneously with the delightful sensation, but the delightful sensation takes pride of place in the beginning. It is much easier to find it is usually stronger, and it is a much grosser appearance, so easier to relate to. What happens to get to the second jhana is that we deliberately let the delightful sensation go into the back of the awareness. It doesn't, they don't disappear right away. They go into the back of our awareness. They sort of hover in the background, and we put the joy in front. That is then the second jhana. Says will then arise second jhana, I presume. And I will take the feeling of joy as my meditation object to enter the third question mark. That's as far as I have gotten. That's fine. Tomorrow we'll talk about third and fourth. That's fine. What, ha what will have to be done in this case, first and second, Anchor them to the point where you can always get in, can stay as long as you like, and come out when you wish. Do that with first and second, and then you have already mastered the beginning of it. Never forget the three steps at the end of the meditation, not in between, at the very end. What did I do to get in? That too is impermanent, and what am I learning? Obviously, I'm learning they're impermanent, but there's far more than that to be learned. So these three steps are very important. When I was meditating, I noticed my breath shift from the right to the left nostril and back, usually one to two times in a session. This disturbed my concentration. Then it seemed to be useful to sit and wait until it decided where it was going to be. Is that correct practice? I found I was less clear when it was in the left nostril. Well, tell you the truth, the b breath has to come out of both. Unless you've got such a cold that it's stuffed up. And when if, if one of the nostrils is totally stuffed up, I can imagine that it doesn't, it goes like this. But what is actually happening is that the attention isn't, and the mindfulness, isn't quite clear enough because possibly on one side it's less noticeable than on the other. So I wouldn't worry about it for one second. 
I just try and stay concentrated. I was in a very peaceful state and felt like I was resting there. I enjoyed this. Then I felt I was losing concentration. I decided to add more energy to my concentration and seemed to be moving to a brighter state when the session ended. Please comment. Well, that's very good. Right. If you feel that you're losing concentration, what you need is more determination to pay more attention. Usually when one feels that one is losing concentration, one is already pretty drowsy. So if that's the case, open the eyes, look at the light, give yourself a pep talk and start all over again. Make it really concentrated by um, having that determination. If it's only slightly, then Tuesday afternoon of experiencing my body loss of my bones, I watched wolves tear me apart without any fight or sensation. Then the animals and people came for my bones. When my head was put on a stick and my spine spine something cut maybe for decoration some curious aspect of what I thought of me asked said no form who what was experiencing that what happened next was a joyful bliss experience eventually bell rang and there I was the next morning we talked about the jhanas before that I labeled it fantasy labeling had no impact on the experience the question is what knows what goes through the experience <laughs> even as the experience evolves to clarity joy and creation what is experiencing it and what is the link to liberation, to liberating that pure state of joy and creation with that that went through the previous stages of experience? A bit much thinking, huh? <laughs> the first thing was fantasy, no doubt. And the second thing, because the fantasy was so interesting, the mind finally got a bit of concentration. So, if you need fantasy in order to get concentrated, by all means use it. Think of wolves tearing you apart or whatever. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Make up a, a storyline. But know that you're using it in order to get concentrated. Sure, it might be easier than getting concentrated on the brain. And then, having finished with the storyline, see whether you can be concentrated. And if you are concentrated, Maybe you get blissful. And who and what and where and when? I think one needs a lot of practice in order to let go of all identification. It's no use asking. The only use is doing. Letting go of identification. Inquiring into the five candles as I explained this morning and finding out there's no answer to this. There's no answer to who, what, when, where did I experience this. The answer lies within us, in our own experience, not in our mind trying to understand. And in order to have the experience, we have to inquire. In order to inquire, we have to be patient patient with ourselves and patient with the possible dukkha that arises. Buddhism is not practiced in order to be happy in the world. Buddhism is practiced in order to transcend the world. And if that's not to your liking, nobody is forcing you to practice it. It's pretty, it's completely, utterly 
voluntary. If one doesn't, hasn't seen that the world cannot provide what we're all looking for, it's highly unlikely that one will practice. As I've grown older, 70 now, I have become more and more accepting of my body and more grateful to it. Taking it to bits this morning was like invading and pulling apart an old friend. I know the next question must be whose friend and I will search for the answer. But right now I'm confused as to whether feelings towards the body as, uh, as, truth as to whether warm feelings, sorry, warm feelings towards the body are okay. Are they always born of attachment? Most certainly. There's no need or any usefulness in disliking the body. I mean, what's there to dislike about a liver and a gallbladder and kidneys and lungs and, and arms and legs? What's there to dislike about it? Nothing at all. Uh, most people start disliking them and they're becoming dysfunctional. But as long as they're functional, there's no reason to dislike them. And there's actually no reason to dislike them when they're dysfunctional. Um, a person at 70 who thinks the body is um, a good friend is very lucky. Great good karma. At that age, many people have had many difficulties with the body already or are getting them. But to look in the, at the body with warmth and affection, because warmth is affection, is attachment. The opposite is the other extreme. The body is a body, that's all. And it has no me in it, it hasn't got anything in it other than all those bits and pieces. And if the body has served one well, one can be extremely grateful for the good karma one has made. But that's it. The rest comes with more contemplation. <laughs> My profession is that of a psychotherapist. After being on this retreat, I'm confused about my work. How can I be of the most help to the people with whom I work? I love my job and wish to stay in this profession. I don't think I'm uh, the right person to ask this. Given the fact that a major portion of our Earth is still cooling after its formation, billions of years ago in extremely high temperatures. How does Theravada Buddhism explain the origination of bhava becoming the concept? Oh dear, oh dear. Um, may I say to the person who is the same one as I had asked before, where I said, please, not so much thinking. Please, practice, don't think. <laughs> if nothing was present excepting the elements, how could any life form arise from ignorant conditions? Certainly an imponderable question, but one that has got the thinking, has me thinking like a skeptic. There are no end of questions that when one has skeptical doubt will be possible to ask and argue about. I wouldn't waste my time while being in a retreat to do that. Do it after Saturday noon. A retreat is not for that. It's not about cooling the earth and heating the earth and uh, how, how the forms have arisen and how they haven't arisen. A retreat is about getting the mind concentrated so that it's sharp and clear and can see everything that goes on inside. And with that, all these things fall by the wayside. A skeptic, is a person that can be told anything and answers with yes but. The uh, Buddha had many of those listening to him and sometimes he was able to convince them and other times he wasn't. But he had more time than we have here. So it's not really useful. Could you talk a little more about body sweeping for pain 
particularly chronic episodic back neck pain that is worsened by a long retreat but it's not but it's not something or other just from sitting not spectral can't read that word but apparently it's not it doesn't come just from sitting uh, the body sweeping can be very helpful with pain it doesn't necessarily have to be it depends entirely upon the amount of concentration one can muster if there is a particular spot in the body which is painful and keeps one away from uh, concentrating it is useful to start at the top of the head and very quickly go to that spot not very um, uh, minutely paying attention to each spot one goes to but quickly going through go to the spot that is painful and try to with the mind move it out through the skin that would be the simplest and easiest way to do and usually only works when the pain is not very bad if the pain is worse one has to do uh, more um, has to do spend more time with it one has to do it more than once usually can do it many times doesn't matter and it can relieve very much any thoughts tips for a first-time retreat person in transitioning uh-huh, back into the world I name so I have no long drive to flip I something home I live home or something I I fly home got it I fly home so I have no long drive to reflect on the experience um, we'll talk about that uh, on the last day how to um, get back into everyday life without losing everything that one has gained in the uh, course at Wednesday night's question answer session you answered a question about anxiety I wrote down first substitute second if it's very strong inquire into it why do I feel it and third an interim step put your mind on a positive feeling a cat however or whatever aren't one and three the same uh, similar not the same the substitution means substitution with the opposite so if there is for instance anxiety about well, let's say getting into an airplane it might crash having total confidence and just getting in there and loving the experience that's substitution with the opposite but if one can't do that take the mind away from that anxiety and put it on a beautiful flower meadow or a little cat or whatever so it is a substitution but it's not a substitution with the opposite I have experienced non-self in myself in others and everything else but whenever I thought of giving up this ego and all the attachment and support system I felt very sad any suggestions on how to let go of this ego totally um, no partially <coughs> to let go of the ego totally is enlightenment and uh, that doesn't seem to be at the moment in the offing <laughs> I would suggest that the first path moment would be something that is possible or at least explainable um, if one actually experiences non-self one has a path moment and that's followed by a fruit moment and if one has a path moment and a fruit moment this kind of question would not arise so having experienced non-self in myself and in others must have been an intellectual understanding and not the experience 
because with worthy experience this would not come up. But I will talk about the possibility or what it entails a path and a fruit moment tomorrow. Briefly. Do the Buddha's monastic precepts such as not eating afternoon, not receiving money, apply to modern times? If so, how are they helpful for liberation? Are they essential for liberation? If not, why did the Buddha teach them? They are essential for non-attachment, but um, that's why they were taught, for non-attachment, for renunciation. You said that um, person, person must be joyful in order to meditate. Do you mean joyful at that moment or having known the experience of joy? Sometimes when I sit, I feel strong emotions that are not joyful. For example, sadness or restlessness. Should I do mindfulness practice at such times or would different practices like loving kindness or contemplation be more useful or appropriate? What is meant is to be joyful when sitting down and if that is not possible when that sadness or restlessness then loving kindness meditation may be very helpful. And if that isn't enough, yes, contemplation. I've been to retreats of many different lengths, from a week end, weekend to three months, and a very variety of times in between. How does a teacher determine how long a retreat should be? How long he or she can stand it? <laughs> Thank you very much for writing notes that you'd like me to come back and teach again. I like to come back. There's no doubt about it. It's very beautiful here. And um, obviously I like to spread the Dhamma, otherwise I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And I'd like to see you all again. But I don't know whether I can or not, um, according to my health. It's all right at the moment. So I don't really, although I have a note here that says, it's better to make a date. You can always cancel it later. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to commit myself in the, uh, right now, but I'll be in touch with Sabina and um, we can discuss it. We have been using the um, overseas phone quite a bit and so we can do that again and we can use fax and, and discuss it as soon as I can see a little clearer. I certainly can't come back next year. Um, I'll be teaching in Switzerland, England and Berlin. And Berlin is farther away from us than Switzerland. So it's also quite a trip. And uh, that will do <laughs> as far as teaching away from Germany. Of course, I will also teach in Germany. So next year is out, but the year after, it's a possibility, but um, I will ask uh, Norman if I see him tomorrow how much in advance he has to know about it, so I'll do it accordingly. I also liked very much another note, which uh, wasn't really a, a question at all, but also about coming back to teach, and I thought it was cute, so I'm going to read it out. Huh? I truly appreciate the teachings you have given on this retreat. Clarity of instruction and talks have helped my practice and strengthened my determination and sense of urgency. I hope you will come back to teach another retreat at Green Gulch as soon as you can stand it and for as long as you can stand it. <laughs> I thought that was very nice. <laughs> Oh, here's the one that we should make dates. Okay, <laughs> we'll keep it in mind. <laughs> On the photocopy of the Sutta 66, it seems that equanimity is something to be abandoned to get to the fourth jhana. Is it considered there as the factor of the third jhana or as a pleasure 
it seems a little contradictory and not very clear to me. Now, it's not at all equanimity that needs to be abandoned. I'll read you what it says. It says that... Where am I? Um, pleasure and pain have to be abandoned, which is equanimity. The fourth jhana is very often described as equanimity. I didn't mention that this morning because there were that many things to mention. Um, the equanimity which arises in the fourth jhana is actually something that one becomes aware of afterwards and something that stays with one to a certain degree, of course not all of it, but to a certain degree so that one is less troubled by the uh, things and uh, unpleasantnesses that uh, confront one. It's often called the jhana of equanimity, but actually what one experiences, what one really feels is that stillness. And obviously, you've got to abandon pain and pleasure because otherwise you can't be totally still. So while the third one still has pleasure in it, and um, it's a traditional way of de describing the uh, abandoning of pain and pleasure, although um, the pain which one could possibly have in those states is just letting go of the pleasurable states. That's the only pain that could possibly arise. So fourth jhana is a jhana of equanimity, but it is something one becomes aware of afterwards. I have really appreciated your words regarding concentrated states, the jhanas. Jhanas are J-H-A-N-A, -A, not jhana. Jhana is something else again. I have found in my meditation that the concentration has gone quite deep and still. Sometimes very clear insights will come through. My concern is that I cannot remember them clearly. I am trusting that the information is available somewhere inside. What I wonder about, I wonder about the not remembering. Do you have some advice or understanding about this state, stage? I had the idea that overall my memory might improve, but overall it seems worse. <laughs> well, If you gain insight during your meditation, you can do one of two things. You can look at that insight more than just superficially and try to impress it upon your mind. In other words, it arises and you actually verbalize it to yourself. Now, in, to gain insight means that there is an experience which you then are able to verbalize. Very often people try to do it the other way around. Verbalizing first and then experiencing. That doesn't work half as well. In fact, it usually doesn't work at all. The experience first and then the verbalization. And the verbalization impresses it upon the mind more than just having it happen, the insight, and getting on with the meditation. So you might have to, if you think you have a poor memory, most people do have poor memories, by the way, you might have to verbalize it more than once, twice, three times, doesn't matter. And if you can't trust your memory at all, you'll have to write it down. And as you write it down and then look at it later, you've got to check it out and see whether that is truly what you experienced. It may not be. So when the mind becomes still, it is quite possible that new insights arise spontaneously. They, um, they do need to be impressed upon the mind. If it is a true insight, which you after, afterwards can recognize as universal truth, which holds true for you too, the microcosm and the macrocosm, then you have to try and live it. If you can't live it, it wasn't an insight. 
it was a flash that, like a flash flood, it comes and it goes. If it's a real insight, you have to try and live it. And as you live it, it becomes part of you. Insight can be compared to learning a foreign language. If you don't use that foreign language, it all disappears to the back of the mind and you can't speak it. Obviously, if somebody else is speaking it, something awakens in you. Oh, yes, I've heard that. I remember what that means. But it isn't readily available. Insights do not disappear. But if they're not being used, they are not readily available. So they have to be in daily life. Ah, put name and address, um, uh, of my own name and address and phone and fax, I've done so. I've put my name, address, phone and fax out there. And I think somebody put you up to asking me to come back, huh? <laughs> yes, that's very clever because that's what they did to the Buddha too. <laughs> Last night, my waking dreams. I'm not sure what that means, waking dreams. Does it mean dreaming when, when I've already woken up? Or being aware of them when one has woken up? I think the latter, huh? Knowing the dream when one has woken up. It's a strange way of expressing dream. Waking dreams. Um, last night, my waking dreams were very disturbing, even destructive. I did not wake in a state of equanimity. It did not seem a good omen for the last full day of the retreat. I have several questions. Are such dreams unusual or are they to be expected at retreats? Actually, they're not unusual at all. The um, mind is supposed to be quiet, not supposed to give voice to all its usual distractions. So while this is happening, it likes to relieve itself in dreams. <laughs> <laughs> How does one regard bad dreams? As dukkha, as accumulated bad karmic results, or just more debris, cluttering clarity of vision? Well, dukkha, as regarding dream as dukkha, is only if one would rather not have had it or if one feels that it has produced something that one wouldn't want only then it's dukkha the unpleasantness exists but suffering from it is not necessary so it doesn't have to be dukkha Accumulated bad karmic results, uh, yes, everybody has those. And debris, certainly. It's certainly debris. How does one treat such dreams? The same as any distraction or unwholesome thought? Uh, yes, letting go as quickly as possible of the remembrance of it. But one can do something else, which may be in a very unpleasant dream, is not so um, not so nice to do, but it, it's very useful. Having woken up from this dream, the mind obviously will say, oh, thank God it was only a dream. It wasn't for real. And it will obviously also say, it wasn't very pleasant. I wonder what all that stuff was that was going on. Well, that's exactly life as we see it. We're dreaming all the time. We think the things that are happening are for real. In reality, when we wake up from all that, we will say, oh, what a relief, it was only a dream. <laughs> and it uh, wasn't very pleasant, but I did the best I could. And having woken up, it's not that the houses fall to pieces, 
and the people aren't there anymore. But their meaning is no longer that of what was before, but it's just as it was in a dream. It's all going on in the dream, but the meaning isn't there. It doesn't mean anything. And also one of the good things about dreaming is that we cannot make karma in sleep and therefore not in our dreams, which is quite um, uh, relieving to know. Even if we have dreadful, destructive dreams, we're not making karma because there's no intention behind it. I tried the loving-kindness meditation of gratitude, not for the dream, but the blessing of this week, and it seemed to help. Yes, certainly, that was a good way to start the day. Often the I is beset with intense fear of annihilation when I'm really not in the picture. If you haven't spoken of this today, could you talk of its antidote? The fear of annihilation, well, the antidote is looking at one's own death in the manner we did this morning or any other manner, any form, it doesn't matter. It's a certainty. It's an absolute certainty. Nobody can argue about it. So how are we going to meet that? And if we are afraid of annihilation, we're obviously afraid of death. So when we no longer, when we're no longer afraid of death, this kind of fear in daily life is also eliminated. <coughs> not to be afraid of one's own death does not happen after one or two contemplations. It takes time. And it takes repeated looking at the reason for the fear. And it takes repeated looking at the certainty. And it also takes repeated looking at what one understands about the death of the body and the non-death of consciousness. The body dies. The consciousness, the mind, which is also totally impersonal, does not die. <coughs> it carries with it the seed of the rebirth because it has within it the craving to be. So that's not meaning that the person we think we are now is going to come back much smaller, um, not being able to do all the things we're able to do now, but the same person, nothing like it. The one we're now will never come back. But the Buddha said, the one who has made the karma and the one who reaps the resultants is the same person, is wrong view. That the one who made the karma and the one who reaps the resultants is a different person, is also wrong view. The answer lies in the middle. And the person only exists because we think it does. What we believe that is what we live by. So it's a personal consciousness that we think of. It's a personal craving to be. And with that craving to be, we arise again. So if that's consoling to know, please remember the one we are now isn't coming back. It isn't like that. And it isn't that there is a personality, but there are karmic resultants. So when the fear of death has disappeared, and that takes doing, then the fear of annihilation is gone. I teach approximately 20 to 25 children. The job requires that as I work, I must try to be mindful of the specific task I'm doing, and I must also be aware of the needs, learning, social and spiritual, of each of these people, many of them going off in different directions at the same time. 
it appears to need a general awareness as well as a one-pointed concentration. While I'm aware that I must move from one to the other as gracefully and smoothly as possible, each task requires sustained awareness and concentration. What are your recommendations? To tell the truth, I don't really know what the exact question is all about. There's awareness, there's concentration, there's sustained, there is graceful, there is smooth, there are children, there is uh, tasks. I don't know what it's all about. I really don't want to try and uh, answer that because I can't look through this question. I don't know what it's about. Are they small children? Are they grown-ups? Are they retarded children? Are they sick? Are they well? Is it in a school? Are they learning to read and write? Or what are they doing? A teacher has to be aware of what goes on, of course. But that's all I can say. I really don't know what the question means. And if the person uh, really needs an answer, they should come and ask me in more specifics. Could you please post the name of the scriptures? One can read over a dying person to increase one's chances of being reborn when the Dhamma is available, could not hear in back of room. Would this also work in the case of sudden death to read over the body or ashes? Well, ashes, the person would have had to have been in a fire. Huh? Um, sudden death, well, yes. A consciousness doesn't leave the body immediately. And to read over somebody something isn't exactly the way it is. Um, what one actually does in Buddhist practices in the um, Theravadan countries, which are primarily Sri Lanka, Thailand and Burma, is to chant, which is recitation, to chant whatever one knows. They are called paritas, and there are books full of them. And they're usually in Pali, but many, many of them have been translated into English. So one needs to know them in order to chant them, but one can read them out. But one reads them out with the understanding that the consciousness of that person is available, and not that there is a, a corpse that one is dealing with. One deals with the consciousness of that person. Whether that consciousness is as we imagine it to be, as we've got it now, or totally different, doesn't matter. So one can recite, chant, or read any one of possibly a hundred different ones, whichever ones one likes. And in order to do that, one needs, if one doesn't know them by heart, one has to have a book containing them. If one doesn't have that available, they're available in every monastery, every Theravada monastery. If one doesn't have that, one can read out something which one considers spiritually uplifting. It doesn't have to be one of those. There are many spiritually uplifting uh, sayings and uh, words, and poems, and any one of those are very good to do. If one wants the person to hear the Dhamma at the very last moment, obviously one should choose something of Buddhist scriptures, but for that if one doesn't, hasn't learned them by heart, one needs to get a book with them in it. One of the things that are, is very um, common to chant is the Karaniya Metta Sutta, which is the Loving Kindness Sutta. It's quite long and uh, translated very well but if one wants to chant one also has to have a, a knowledge how to do that one learns that in monasteries so one can read it instead it's also all right and of course Buddha Dhamma Sangha appreciation and reverence is also of used or always used you spoke of the feeling of responsibility of the fourth jhana. Can you say something about the connection 
if any, to the feeling of compassion. The more we feel connected to other beings, to other people primarily, the easier it is to have compassion. But compassion is always connected also to the insight into one's own dukkha. Because one has to have first have compassion with oneself. If one doesn't have compassion with oneself, then what is aroused is pity for others. And pity is the near enemy of compassion. So if we have compassion for our own difficulties, then we can have empathy with it for the difficulties of others. The fourth jhana gives a, a clear experience I don't think I said fourth. No, I'm sure I didn't. It's a sixth jhana, the uh, infinity of consciousness, not the fourth jhana. Fourth jhana is stillness, peace, and the me, the observer, being minute. The sixth jhana, universal, uh, the uh, infinity of consciousness, makes it possible to realize that there is universal consciousness cosmic consciousness. And when we realize that, obviously we feel utterly connected and not separate. And then if we feel connected and not separate, loving kindness is easier, compassion is easier than when we feel separate from each other. So the connection comes from the understand the experience of the um, consciousness which is not private and personal. And not having a private personal consciousness means that we realize we are responsible. Responsible for the emanations <coughs> that come from us. And these emanations are based upon our, the contents of our thoughts and the content of our emotions. So we are responsible for everyone that is anywhere that can take part in universal consciousness. If one is going for a job interview and needs a job for survival, not for extravagance, how can one not be anxious or result orientated and how does one deal with this type of anxiety? Well, having had universal consciousness, one knows that the universe is going to take care of one. So whether it's this job or another, it doesn't matter. And the not being result orientated is the only way that we can approach anything peacefully and without it doesn't have to even to be a job interview, anything at all. And if we do approach it peacefully, then we have a much better chance of doing it well. It's much more difficult, in fact it's impossible, to do something well when we're anxious about it. The anxiety takes pride of place. And it's been well known that some children are so anxious about their examinations that while they are excellent students otherwise, they flunk <coughs> each exam. And it has been seen that that's entirely due to this results orientation, the achievement syndrome. It's not absolutely common, but it does happen over and over again. And it's not only for children, it's for grown-ups, the same thing. Going for this job interview is like taking an exam and I must pass. What it does, actually, is a graphic example of the first and second noble truth. I have dukkha because I want something. And I want it so bad that my dukkha, in this case anxiety, is all pervading. So why not use the first and second noble truth and then look at it and say, why am I making myself miserable? What? Isn't that foolish? 
it helps a great deal when one can see that one is foolish in relating to oneself. And when one sees that, then one is very foolish how one deals with things for oneself, one can start smiling about oneself. And that way the anxiety is relieved and maybe can actually be eliminated. If it isn't this job, so it's another. And if we have the best intention and have given our very best to the situation, whatever that situation may be, it's all we can do. The reaction that we get, the results that accrue are, first of all, karmic resultants, and secondly, the resultants put out by other people. Thinking about this morning's contemplation and the instruction to live each day with a sort of death in mind, I wondered about beginning the day with a contemplation verse to give us about being of the nature